And I bring greetings to those who are in the room today and for many, many individuals that are watching us online this week, including students and faculty and staff and alumni. So I uh, bring greetings. This week we've had a privilege of thinking about heritage at Dallas Theological Seminary. And on Tuesday, I was privileged to look back and forward as we look down the road. And uh, yesterday, we heard from Andy Wildman, and he gave us a wonderful perspective of history at Dallas Seminary. And our speaker today is going to do many of the same things, uh, looking at Dallas Seminary and the city of Dallas and, and where Dallas Seminary is. So it is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lanier Burns, Research Professor of Theology and Senior Professor of Systematic Theology. Dr. Burns received his undergrad degree from Davidson College and then earned his THM and THD from DTS and a PhD from the University of Texas at Dallas. He devotes his time to writing, conferences, and pastoral leadership while also being involved in postdoctoral research at Harvard and Oxford universities. Dr. Burns is actively involved in Christian and secular organizations, serving for over 40 years as president of the Asian Christian Academy in India and participating in numerous neuroscientific activities. His research interests include Trinitarianism, anthropology, sin, eschatology, the relationship of science and religion, and issues in social justice. He and his wife, Kathy, have four children and 11 grandchildren. In his spare time, he loves spending time with his family and enjoying sports. Little personal story, when I was visiting Dallas Seminary, before I became a student, way back when, I stepped into a classroom by this professor who was named Lanier Burns. And I sat there as a prospective student and I watched this man up front just rant and rave. And because of that, from that time forward, when we're not being recorded, I'll give my Lanier Burns impersonation later. But he changed my life because of his passion and zeal for the Word of God. And he helped me think theologically. So Dr. Burns, thank you for all those years ago how you have faithfully communicated all these years. You impacted me even then that has carried on to today. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Lanier Burns today? You notice how I ran up to the pulpit. <laughs> I'm 77 years old. I'm one of the senior members of the faculty. And what I'm gonna share with you today, here's the topic of my message. 2020 is a mirror image of 1968 when I came here. A mirror image, exactly the same. Except our times were even harder and even worse. And I intend to tell you about that. I intend to talk a little bit about how Dallas has changed. I was exhorted to be creative in Dallas Seminary, but finding my way home every day when construction was on every hand was, taught me creativity like I've never seen. And uh, my wife said, how did the day go? I said, fine, I got home in 45 minutes today. It's a 15 minute drive in the COVID virus, okay? I came to Dallas Seminary from the Navigators and I didn't know anything about theology. I knew almost nothing, but I did know this verse. The things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful people who should be able to teach others also. That is the premier discipleship passage in the Bible, premier. And it's always stayed with me through all of my Dallas days and so forth. And um, so, what I want to do today, and the reason I want to do it, I want to say there's a strong tendency at Dallas Seminary to rest in the womb of the school. But I discovered as I look back over my ministry and my life, I've discovered you live in a real world. And you're expected to impact that world. You live in a very real city that is unbelievably unchristian in its attitudes and approach to life. 
and you live in a seminary for an all too brief time. You just can't learn to walk with the Lord in two years. I had a four year program. You can't learn to walk with the Lord in four years. And what you need desperately to go with your Bible knowledge, which is first rate, is you need experience. You need to get out where life is real and start learning about how the Bible timelessly fits the issues of life. So I want to talk about the United States, first of all, and I want to draw four parallels between 1968 and 2020. Then I want to talk about constant change in Dallas, Texas, and I want to talk about constant change in Dallas Seminary, accepting the most basic things. There are four things, I could talk forever on this, but there are four things that parallel 1968 and 2020 in the United States. Elections, polarization, crisis, and utopian fantasies. And all of those are very, very large, okay? 1968 was an election year. The president was Lyndon B. Johnson. Johnson shocked the nations early in 68 when he said, I will no longer run and no longer seek the nomination of president of the United States. His whole Democratic Party could not believe that. But boy, you should watch the fleas and ticks circle. And among those were Eugene McCarthy, senator from Minnesota, who was the anti-war candidate and the favorite of students and celebrities. There was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, and there was the Kennedy, of course, Robert Kennedy, three candidates, all right? George Wallace ran on the American Independent Party on the platform, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Unless you think there hasn't been progress, we don't have an American Independent Party now. But anyway, the Republicans put up Richard Nixon, former Vice President, Ronald Reagan, Governor of California, and Nelson Rockefeller, Governor of New York. By the way, 1968, Shirley Chisholm became the first African-American woman elected to Congress. Big year, big year. Now, in every election year, our country is always polarized, in case you don't know that. Now, I'm, my 78th year, we might find some unity, but election years are polarization years. And in 68, the great polarizing fact was the Vietnam War. Now, I came to Dallas Seminary after being an infantry military policeman, okay? Not a chaplain. And I feel like I gained tremendous ground by doing that because I've seen life in the raw most of my life. Most Dallas Seminary students just have never seen that. I read the graduating student survey, and frankly, folks you need to get out and see it like it is. And because of that, I've had the strongest doctrine of sin, probably, on faculty, and that helps me to see the grace of God with greater clarity. But Vietnam was huge, and it was our COVID, and it divided the nation right down the middle. President Johnson, at the beginning of the year, started uh, Operation Rolling Thunder. Now what that was was 300,000 flyovers of Vietnam bombing attacks. 300,000 of them for 77 days. When Rolling Thunder was ended, Vietnam was practically a virtual sand pile. The Vietnamese tunneled under their land and created tunnels. So as that was going on, they came out of their tunnels and they started the Tet Offensive, a very powerful military move. And what happened is the Viet Cong, the communists, attacked 60 district capitals. And folks, as it has been in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was something of a standoff. The real turn in that war came in 1968 because Walter Cronkite, the grandfather of American news said, I'm going to Vietnam myself and get underneath the Washington propaganda. And he went over there and he saw something entirely different. And he came home and he said, the United States should now consider an honorable withdrawal. Very similar to Iraq and Afghanistan, another parallel. Polarization always leads to conflict, very dangerous, deadly conflict and America turned into a war zone. 
It was division over the war, and it was division over civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. reached the pinnacle of his nonviolent approach to social issues in 1963 with his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C. But by 1968, that had grown thin, and King's place was taken by very militant, violent groups who tore through the cities. King was assassinated on April 4th, 68. Robert Kennedy was assassinated on June 5th, 68. One in Memphis, the other in Los Angeles. No discrimination about territory, you just got killed wherever you were. 110 cities in America broke out in riot, looting, and arson. 110 cities. Okay? Hundreds of campuses, hundreds of campuses exploded. People don't remember that the students took over Columbia University in California, Berkeley. They took it over, captured it, drove the faculty off. But the biggest headliner was Kent State. The nation that was torn up then involved Detroit, Chicago, Washington, and Baltimore. Very similar to Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, New York, and Washington today. And this unrest went worldwide. Most Americans don't know this. London, Toronto, Paris, Berlin, Athens, Prague, Panama City, Tokyo, Nigeria, and Pyongyang all exploded in violence. Worldwide, another parallel. In America, the New Left sponsored the violence. It was called the New Left. Joined by Students for Democratic Society, SDS, the Weatherman Underground, and the New York Radical Women's Group held a faux funeral in Arlington Seminary to bury traditional womanhood, all in 1968. Muhammad Ali refused the draft. And he spoke on hundreds of campuses against the war. The Barrington brothers were Catholic priests, and they went into recruitment centers. They, they just stole box on top of box on top of box of draft cards and had a public burning. Charles Manson, did you ever hear the name? Took 35 followers outside Los Angeles, and they had a murder spree. She, actress Sharon Tate among them. I mark off Chicago for special mention. Truly, it was extraordinary. It was where the De Democratic Convention was held. Um, the Yippies and the Hippies, okay, now you, these kind of have worn out, but the Yippies are the Youth International Movement. The Hippies were the worldwide countercultural movement. They descended on the city by the thousands and threatened very loudly to poison the city water with LSD, which is an hallucinatory drug. 10,000 nude yippies held a float-in in Lake Michigan. I've never seen that, you know, okay. So they did. And they nominated their, campus, uh, their, their candidate, who was named Pegasus. And their motto was, we may not get the White House, but at least we'll have breakfast. Drugs were everywhere, everywhere, just like today. The motto of the day was make love, not war. One year from 1968 was the Woodstock Festival, which was the celebration, the sexual revolution was in full swing. So, Richard Daly, Democratic mayor of Chicago, when he was faced with violence, called out 12,000 cops. He called out 6,000 National Guardsmen. He called out, listen, listen, 6,000 Army troops armed with high-powered rifles, bazookas, and flamethrowers. At the end of the day, Nixon and Agnew won the presidency over law and order. 
Now, in times of election polarization and crisis like we have today and like we had in 68, people will dissolve into addiction and utopian fantasies. It happens every time. Utopia is an ideal society apart from God. It's one of the primary themes of human history. Out of those utopian fantasies, the New Age movement was born. This movement underlies much of what you will face in your ministry. First of all, it brought in Eastern religions. And the two that it brought in first and foremost were Hinduism and Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism was a thing of the day, and you would go to a monastery and sit there until you got a vision, and a lot of people came home dry. Capitol Hill takeover was a utopian expression, okay? And that is a direct descendant because utopias are never accompanied by peace. The crow's foot symbol, which was so prominent in the 60s as a symbol for peace, was all over Portland, Oregon. I'm amazed. I've seen it before. Deja vu. The Beatles did their white album, Revolution One, that fomented conflict and violence. The Beatles. And then they fled to India to learn Hinduism under Maharishi Yoga's ashram. And they never came back. They came back fractured. The musical hair was large on Broadway. And it, the song of there was very, very popular. It was, this is the age of Aquarius, the age of Pisces, the age of peace. And at this time, I was learning at Dallas Seminary, people cry for peace, peace, but there is no peace. This was the source of mix and match spirituality that you will have to face in your ministry. This is where the nuns and duns came from. People who abandon the institutional church for various reasons and they go off and do their thing claiming to be disciples of Christ or some other religion. Just a minute about Dallas, Texas. It was in transition from cotton to oil and banking. 1934, the Magnolia Oil Building, don't ever look up the places I mentioned because they're not there. The Magnolia Oral Building was built in 1934 as the tallest skyscraper west of the Mississippi, 21 stories. On top of it was an 11-foot red horse named Pegasus. Pegasus, in Greek mythology, was the son of Poseidon, who was god of the ocean. So when Magnolia Oil Building put Pegasus flying off like a phoenix, it meant that the son of the God of the ocean was bringing up an ocean of oil. Thus, East Texas. It remained the tallest skyscraper until 1954 when the Republic Bank building towered over Dallas, towered over Dallas at 36 stories. The retail was centered in Neiman Marcus, Teich Gettinger and Sanger Harris, huge stores in downtown Dallas, and they occupied that position until 19, uh, 15, 1965 when North Park Mall was just getting off the ground. Dallas began to go broke in 1965 with North Park. The pulpiteer of the day was W.A. Bill Criswell, First Baptist Church. Still seems to me to be one of the premier preachers, and pastors in Dallas history. Criswell College was Gaston Avenue Baptist Church, where Dallas held special services. Okay? Central Expressway was envisioned in 1950 to go from I-345, just south of town, to McKinney. All of your outlying towns were not suburbs. McKinney was a frontier town. It was way out there. There was only one loop around Dallas. That was Loop 12. And it was the Northwest Highway, by the way. It was 250 miles around. I was a youth teacher at that time, and my kids used to go out on Sunday afternoon to drive around Dallas. It took all afternoon, okay? Theater Row was on Elm Street. Magnificent theaters. 
and Dallas used to traipse down to Elm Street. The live musicals went to Fair Park Music Hall, Fair Park, until Dallas moved everything three blocks north to the Arch, the Arch District very recently. The only remnant of Dallas theaters is Magnolia Theater, the Majestic Theater, okay, downtown. The Dallas Cowboys played in the Cotton Bowl. The Washington Senators decided to move to Dallas and become the Texas Rangers. And they played in Arlington Stadium before 20,000 people. The only thing that has been a constant popularity are burgers and barbecue. <laughs> Everything else has changed. Um, Dallas has been rebuilt twice since I've lived here, twice and revisioned. A new home costs $20,000. A new car costs $3,000. Gas costs 34 cents a gallon. And Harvard's tuition was $2,000 a semester. That's a long time ago, long time ago. Now let me talk about seminary just a minute. Dallas Seminary is cuddled away between Live Oak and Swiss and in the old days, St. Joe's and Apples. Say goodbye to Apple, okay? Haskell, St. Joe's, Washington, okay? Odd assortment. Budget Tell was over here on Haskell, and we called it the Roach Motel. Um, its windows had red lights, so I'm sure that signified something. Across the road here was Margot's Lamode retail outlet. It was quite a thing during when I was here. There were all kinds of fast food eateries. Of course, you had your McDonald's, you had your Jack in a Box and other things like that. Baylor was only Hoblet Cell, the big building that's right on Gaston. And the Greek Orthodox Church used to have a festival of Greek food that was very popular with the seminarians. Now it's our book center. Semi-popular with our students, okay? <laughs> all right, okay. There was an odd assortment of apartments and houses around. Asian Christian Academy was born in a house without a floor behind the leadership center. And we used to go there four times a week to pray for that seminary. It's now a work of 5,000 people, seminary, orphanage, a kid's school of 3,500 Hindu and Muslim kids, 70% who come to know Christ. And a hospital. Um, all the married students lived in, in, in houses along this street right here, okay, along Apple, and they lived just around campus. Swiss Air, Swiss Apartments, those were famous names back then. And uh, you all have it really well, by the way. Gaylord and sundry other buildings down along the way are where other marriages live, and the singles all lived in Stearns Hall. We had 400 students, no women, and a few internationals. There were 30 faculty. We used to pack out Schaefer Chapel, pack it out, okay? And uh, all the older faculty, uh, Pentecost comes to mind, knew Dr. Chafer. So we would hear about Dr. Chafer every day. And that makes me sad because I know that now with 2,400 students, we've lost something. There was an esprit de corps in the seminary in those days that was remarkable. We sang old hymns, old hymns. And Chaplain Richard Sumi, you don't know these names, but he would explain the hymns theology every chapel and then Don Wurtson, who teaches at Southwestern Baptist, would play the organ and the piano, and we had a great time. You had assigned seats, and they took attendance every day. <laughs> there was one conference, the W.H. Griffith Thomas Conference. There was a spring and fall Bible conference. Uh, Vernon McGee would always leap through Leviticus, or roam through Romans, or jump through Genesis. He was one of the primary ones. William Allen Dean came from Philadelphia and John Mitchell came from Phoenix. And they were excellent Bible teachers. 
You don't need everything we have educationally to really build the word into your life. The big event of the seminary day was Founders Day. And we would go down to the Fairmont Hotel, rent all the ballrooms, and it was a glorious gathering. It's somewhat like the advancement gathering at Westin Galleria. Okay, both were fundraisers. In a little shack right back here next to Todd and Walford, was the Dallas Book Center. And it was manned by a very faithful servant of the Lord, Bob Schrader, okay? You would go in there and books would be everywhere. And you had every intent of not buying a single one. And Schrader would come out and he had what he called a double X sale. Everything was always double X. And you'd be looking around and you'd say, well, Bob, I guess I'll buy another day. He'll say, double X, Kyle and Dalich, for $45, boy, I never left the book center without more books than I could carry. I said, I'll be back and get the second load in just a minute. <laughs> we use class notes, 30 pages at most, okay? We used hard copies only, no software. We used typewriters and we used carbon papers. And God forbid, if you ever made a mistake, you have to redo the whole doggone page. The big doctrinal topic of the day, the big doctrinal topic was apocalyptic eschatology. Everybody wanted to know the signs of the times and how it matched prophecy. Much of that was due to Dr. Pentecost and Dr. Walver. But in 1970, C.C. Carlson and Hal Lindsey wrote Late Great Planet Earth and it was a runaway bestseller. The Six Day War was one year before I came to seminary, and I still see Moshe Diane with his patch over his eye, driving in front of a tank like George Patton, leading Israel against the enemy. I came to Dallas Seminary at a time of turmoil, big turmoil. And I came here not caring very much about grades and credits, but I wanted to know the Bible. I left my background. Not one person in my background supported my coming to Dallas Seminary. Not one. My wife had serious reservations about coming. How can everybody not like it and we are still supposed to come? Is it ever going to be any different? And in fact, we came for advice about where we should stay and we stayed in a bordello down off of Interstate 20 because it cost $15 a night. And the seminary officials say, well, that's about all DTS students can afford. Well, we moved the next day to a large purple and pink hotel run by the mob. It was not an auspicious beginning with 170 degree, uh, seven degrees outside. But I wanted to know the word. And I wanted something that I could serve the church with and my family with. And I want to say that Dallas Seminary has a lot of problems, which all of you will know before you graduate. But on issues of biblical exposure, I give it an A+. I give it an A+. I don't think there's another place you can go to know the word quite like you know it here. It's priceless. I've been involved in a few ministries. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do when I was in seminary, but I worked in South Dallas on dirt floors. I worked in West Dallas. And if you had legacy, you could get an adult Bible class, but I had no legacy. I've served in paired local ministries like Billy Graham's Crusades, east of the Mississippi, while I was a department chairman and full-time teacher. I was chairman of the board of Pine Cove Ministries when it expanded. I've had administrative roles, I've had counseling roles, I've had conflict resolution, which you will absolutely need because I was elected chairman of the board of my church when it went from 3,500 to 750 in two weeks. And above all, co-founding and development of a mission in India. When I graduated from DTS, I was drowning in thousands of facts. You will too, and you won't remember a one of them. So I want to talk to you about what a Dallas education has done for me and the way I live, all right? I chose two kinds of passages. One, irrefutable 
central, self-reflexive passages and others passages that emphasize Jesus Christ. Genesis 1:27. God said, let us make man in our image. In our image he made man, male and female made he them. That is the basis of kingdom and covenant. I use it in every class. Lamentations 3.22, your love never fails and your compassion's unceasing. Great is thy faithfulness because people will not be that faithful to you. You'll count on the Lord's faithfulness. Micah 6.8, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to seek mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I've heard that verse so many times in the last several weeks. It's incredible. These are verses that shine. Mark 10, 44. If any of you would be great, let him be least of all. For to be great, you must be servant of all. And I think that's the most powerful verse in the entire Bible coming straight from Jesus, and it's irrefutable. You will all want to be great. But greatness does not lie in socially acknowledged positions, gratefully acknowledges in the eyes of the Savior. John 13, 34, by this shall only know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. A student told me the other day and they said, I've really learned a lot of information, but I get all my love off campus. Now that shouldn't be said at a seminary like ours. First Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. How do you argue with that? How do you argue? You say, but we're an educational institution. Well, then that's part of God's word. It's meant to be lived. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. I gave to you first of all things of first importance what I received. How that Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day. The gospel. Now, when you leave Dallas Seminary, you're going to go out there and no one's going to ask you what you made. No one cares what you made. No one cares what you know. They're going to come to you with a need and you need verses like this. That's the meat on which ministry is built. And it's got to be, you don't have time to dig in here, okay? You've, it's got to be there, all right? Is that in the Bible? Yeah. Philippians 2.5, let this attitude be in you which was in Christ Jesus, make yourself of no reputation. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding. What you want is peace, especially in a world like this, in a city like this, and in a seminary like this. You need peace. Colossians 1, 16, Christ made all things. All things were made by him, through him, and for him. So what I wonder is what's left for me? Answer, nothing. And that will give you freedom. It will give you peace. It will help you to go through hard times. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, do heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Finally, Revelation 1.17 I am the Alpha and the Omega, the living God. Do not be anxious. Everything is Christ. You will discover when you leave Dallas Seminary, Jesus Christ will quickly dissolve into a point on an outline. You'll just be so busy. And it can't be that way. He has to be everything because without him, we are nothing. So these verses stayed with me. I got them at Dallas Seminary. And I'll have to say that in 55 years of ministry, this education has been terrific. It has served me well. I'm so glad I didn't go to a denominational seminary that was going liberal so fast that you couldn't even keep up with it. So pray with me. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.